Welcome, welcome my friends to the Beggars and Brawlies podcast. This is episode 31, recorded October 22nd of 2021, as I sit in my cozy home writing studio. It's cold enough in Colorado to have a fire now, and I cannot tell you how happy it makes me. In today's episode, I find out that lurking behind all the strange charts and graphs that I make as I plan my next novel, there is a subconscious puppet master directing my stories, and I think it wants to talk. Tide Collar Chronicles has always been a trilogy in my mind. I've always wanted to keep this series neat and tidy, quick to the point, epic in scope, but still, like, bite-sized somehow. I started trying to write the third book in May, because I'd finished the second one in April, and I spent most of a month trying to plan this book, which is weird for me, because I love planning and I tend to do it pretty quickly, and I just couldn't make something about it work, and that's half the reason that I switched to writing The Dragon Bard, during the summer is I just kind of needed a break and I was a little bit confused about why I wasn't getting traction on this story. Why the plan just seemed awkward no matter how much I tried to polish it or put it through my usual charts and graphs and funnels and whatnot. And it remained that way all summer. It was in the back of my mind and I would think through it as I was driving and I just couldn't make sense of what this story was supposed to be until the fruit season ended. I got COVID, I got better, I flew to South Carolina, hung out with my family, and then I had a two day drive back from South Carolina without my family because two days of driving with toddlers sounds like hell. So instead uh, I drove and they flew. And I had a lot of time to think as I was driving, especially once I got into Kansas. (laughs) And somewhere in that long drive, I had this thought, what if that book I've been trying to plan is actually two books. And as soon as I thought it, everything made sense. There's like two relationships that Alethea is trying to work through. There's two magic systems she needs to learn. There's kind of two epic moments where things come to a head. And if you split it into two books, they just evenly divide themselves into all the things that each book needs. And uh, that was crazy for me because I thought I was the one in control of this story and it seems like I should just be able to say no 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 this is one book we're writing a trilogy I'll just cut this stuff out but the story wouldn't be as good that way and ultimately that's the thing and it's the very strange thing because I should be the one deciding this right but I got this sense then that hmm perhaps there's something deeper than my conscious decisions that are driving these stories and it's certainly something I've noticed that when I'm writing and I'm open to the possibilities of the story, things that are not in my outline or my plan will come up that are just straight up better. And I don't know where they come from, but if I follow them, the story's better. So I put that in my pocket. I got home. I divided the story into two books and things worked really well. And the last week I've just been diving deep into planning geekery, which is a wheelhouse of mine. I would say that I love doing it uh, almost as much as I love world building. (laughs) Not quite as much as just sitting down and uh, creating a world from scratch. That's a deep love of mine. And honestly, like I should probably just be a dungeon master because (laughs) I just like to create worlds uh, more than I like plotting or even charactering. So uh, I started doing that. And as usual, I trotted out all my strange charts and graphs and started scribbling all over things and had a bunch of documents open in my computer and was putting things back and forth between them and used this like plotting method that I made up a couple books ago that I think I'm probably going to have to write a nonfiction book on because it's really cool and it really helps me organize my thoughts. And I use this other thing that I made up that it turns out that I probably have used before after I looked at it and you know, like all kinds of just like, I like to use notepad because there's no formatting and I've just got like tons of scribbles in there about character and plot and what would be cool, etc. And as usual, somewhere in the middle of all that scribbling, the story gelled. And I was like, okay, this is what it is. This is what needs to happen. And then it's just a matter of polishing it. And I can start actually writing the thing, which, by the way, I think I'm going to do today, which is cool after I'm done recording this. But I realized something else, maybe because that one book is actually two experience was rattling around in my brain. I realized that as much as I love my charts... I don't think it's actually about the charts. I think I could probably use a completely different set of charts or just be writing in that notepad without anything else. 
or be doing it longhand or whatever. I think that I just need to wander around in my consciousness long enough for the little lumps of my subconscious to poke out for me to trace out the edges of them and be like, ah, this is much better because I don't actually, I didn't actually know that my book was two books. And in the same way, um, in charting out the, the details of book number three, there were so many things that sort of just suggested themselves as I was thinking about something different that I was like, ooh, that's really cool. And those are the things that now I'm the most excited about writing in the book. So it's made me realize that I'm not really in control or I shouldn't be in control. <laughs> that actually there's a deeper instinct or subconscious or something that is working on these stories that already has good ideas for them that I should just listen to um, instead of trying to ignore. I think I probably didn't tap into that at all in my first books. And I think that my writing's better for tapping into it. And I think that my weird charts and graphs and like half finished documents of notes are my way of tapping into it. Like this is the way that I do a tree rubbing and then see what the bark looks like. Like I have something to deal with or it's like, here's a space where my instincts can come out in the less messy way of if I was a complete pantser, I would just start writing and stop when I didn't know what to do and kind of like, I don't know what they do, meditate or something to try to find what it is that should happen next or what this character should do. Um, I've always thought of myself as a plotter, as a planner, as, you know, like sort of having control over everything and figuring it all out ahead of time so I can focus just on the pros and the smaller details when I'm writing. And um, the more that I pay attention to how my best stories come about and my planning process, I think I'm just a discovery writer who does it different <laughs> or a pantser as they call them. Um, and I think that's probably the most honest way to write and produces the best stories. Uh, even if it's a total pain in the ass. <laughs> so this is just something that I'm realizing this month is that, wow, I am not as much of a planner as I thought, and I am not in nearly as much control as I thought. And that's kind of a big thing to realize. You know, you have these moments of self-discovery where you're like, whoa, I actually always forget to put my toothbrush away. Or like, I actually always lie about the things that I'm really feeling because I'm afraid that people won't listen to them. And once that gets into your conscious, it's so powerful because then you can start to take action on it. It's not driving you, you're the one driving. And so I guess me realizing that I'm more of a pantser than I thought is powerful because now I know what to do when I'm stuck is to just go wander in my charts and graphs and the answer that I already know but don't know that I know <laughs> or don't consciously know uh, will come up, and that's so valuable to me. And it's also really interesting to think about, just like when you realize something about yourself and it becomes conscious, how you can then take action on it and not be driven by it, how finding these subconscious elements of the stories that I want and making them conscious will change my writing process. And I don't know how they're going to change it. I'm just excited to do it because it feels like the right thing to do. So... I wonder if you've ever had that kind of experience. If you've ever had those subconscious things suddenly become conscious, you know, whether it's in a creative endeavor or just in your personal life or in your interactions with other people. For me, it's like one of the coolest things that being a human being has to offer is finding out things about this person that, for me, I've been hanging out with for 40 years. and <laughs> You'd think I knew by now, but I don't. <laughs> these stories I only hang out with for a year or so and it turns out I don't really know them either I've always had to do a revision after I finish the draft because only at the end of it do I know what's been going on inside my characters and then I go back and make all their internal thoughts and their like personal struggles make sense because only after I'm done writing it do I have any idea what this story has actually meant to them and that to me that's a really important part of the story so I guess my characters have always been going through that journey too of getting their subconscious to conscious. And by the end of a draft, I usually have an idea what that is. So I just find it fascinating. And I wonder uh, if you've ever had that kind of experience. It's the kind of thing I love to talk about. So if you want to hit me up with an email 
or you know if you're an audio person because you're listening uh send me a a voicemail or a voice email or whatever the internet is full of power you'll find a link to do that in the show notes and as promised i have uh, another chapter of the dragon bard for you which is in some ways my newest story and i have been following my subconscious a little bit more on this one because it's not super planned out and there's been a couple of times where the story has taken a left turn for me uh just based on something that's come up in the moment and that's been really fun (laughs) so this chapter is definitely one that uh i just when i write okay a little bit of a spoiler but it's a fight scene when i write them unlike everything else i really do not plan what's going to happen i have no idea i just kind of let the choreography happen and i love doing that so i've always been a panther in my fight scenes and um this is no exception this is kind of the chapter where finally all of our build up and setup is coming to fruition and things are really changing and we're setting up one of the big lines of the book going forward at least i think it's going to be one of the big lines who knows actually what's going to happen but anyway i'm not going to read the whole thing for you because as i've said in other podcasts uh that would be long and a lot of work and i'm going to read this thing once and carefully when i'm done with draft one and i've revised it and the story is as good as i can make it then i will give you an audio version uh i'll probably charge you for it just like the book for now it's free if you want to read the first draft on my website And my first drafts come out pretty clean. There's a link to that in the show notes, including the full chapter of what I'm about to tease you with. So without further ado, this is chapter seven of the Dragon Bard. Make your moment. What of house sponsorship then? The men were yelling when Makina turned her attention back to them. Have you just come to taunt us or to make sure we don't get out of line? Why is Ducrus here at all, if not to join the cause? It was a measure of how agitated the crowd was getting, that they no longer quieted for Alamina's response. If the girl had been a girl, and not one of the Empress's highly trained spy assassins, she would have been in deep trouble. As it was, she seemed to be enjoying it. The girl who was not Alamina ripped a sword from a man nearby and slammed the flat on the table. That got their attention. I am here, she said quietly, to parley with the man in charge of this operation. The brains behind all this, she waved a hand at them, as if unable to come up with a fitting noun, stuff you have here. If he or she would kindly step forward, we could be about our business. Interesting. All Makina wanted to do was get out, but she filed the information away anyway. Whatever else the hands were here to do, they were looking for leaders. That could be useful. Told you, miss, Turkin said, the sweat actually rolling down his face now, despite his thin set of poor town furs. There was one man, at least, who understood how badly this was going. Master's off on other business. Set me in charge of the Congress, but in terms of the brains behind it, he shrugged. This is kind of it. This is kind of it, she repeated slowly, looking out at the crowd. She glanced at her attendants, who had fanned further out from her, and shrugged. Well, let's be about it then. A rapier appeared, rammed through Turkin's chest. There was no lead-up, no drawing of the blade, no blood even, yet. Just a blade suddenly stuck through his chest. Makina tensed. One of them was a kineticist then. She needed to move soon, if she was going to move. All right, I hope that whetted your appetite. It's an awesome chapter. (laughs) It's an action-filled chapter. Whether you think it's awesome or not, I can't say. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're enjoying that serial and you enjoyed my talk about the strange, strange ways we have of finding out what it is that we already know. With that, I'm going to leave you for another podcast. I hope this finds you well as usual and in communication with your muse, however they make themselves known. And as ever, in the company of some good books. Until next time. For more information on Levi Jacobs and his books, including the award-winning Tide Collar Chronicles, please visit www.levijacobs.com. Or for a free audiobook, only available to podcast listeners, go to www.levijacobs.com/free. Thanks for listening, and read on.